Welcome to the World Euchre Association webinar, How Can We Streamline the Licensing of Small Modular Reactors? A question and answer session will funnel the panel discussion. We encourage you to get involved. Please submit questions via the Q&A function, including which speaker you would like to address the question to and we will seek to address the questions either in written form throughout the webinar, or the moderator will bring them up during the live discussion. Also, you have the option within the Q&A function to use the thumbs up button on the questions raised, which will help highlight the questions to the moderator. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's event. Vice Chair of the World Nuclear Association's Cooperation in Reactor Design and Licensing Working Group, Frank Lignini. Frank is Codes and Standards Senior Manager at Framatome. He's held several positions over his 33 years in industry, including a three year period at the IAEA and representing IMPRO at the Risk and Safety Working Group of the Generation 4 International Forum. And with that, Frank, the floor is yours. Well, um, hello, everyone. Small modular reactors provide great potential to decarbonize electrical grids and other applications, such as district heating, process heat for industry, hydrogen and synthetic fuel production, and to supply electricity to remote or off-grid areas. The World Nuclear Association recently published a report design maturity and regulatory expectations for SMRs, which found that in order to facilitate the large scale development of SMRs, it will be critical to reduce uncertainty and risk in the licensing process when reactor designs are to be built in various countries. This will require streamlining of licensing approach with an unprecedented level of collaboration between reactor vendors, project developers, national regulators and governments. In today's panel, you will hear from a diverse range of experts as they discuss these issues. The large number of SMR designs, differing levels of design, technical maturity, differing licensing frameworks for different requirements, risk introduced by these differences for SMR vendors and project developers, opportunities and challenges that streamlining of licensing approaches would create, need for widespread development of SMRs, and need for greater international collaboration. I am joined today by an esteemed panel of experts to discuss these issues. So we will hear successfully, successively and successfully Tom Bergman. Tom Bergman is Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Muscale Power. In addition, Tom has held the role of Chair of the Small Modular Reactor Task Force at the World Nuclear Association for over six years. And also he acts as Vice Chair of the Cordell Working Group. Anna Bradford is the Deputy Director of the Division of Nuclear Reactor Licensing in the Office of Nuclear Reactors at the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Ms. Bradford has been with the NRC for 21 years, during which time she has held positions in multiple offices in the agency, leading efforts in a wide range of areas, including small modular reactor licensing and non light water reactor policy issues. We will also hear Nadezhda Salnikova. She is head of business development department of Afrikantov OKBM GSC, and she is an acting expert of the IAEA IMPRO Working Group for case study on deployment of factory fueled transportable SMRs. Rafael Caspro is Chief Executive Officer of Sintos Green Energy SA. This is a company focused on deep decon decarbonization of the largest privately owned industrial group in Poland. Sintos Green Energy SA develops and invests in zero emission technologies like offshore wind on Baltic Sea, small modular reactors, micro modular reactors and hydrogen. Also, last but not least, we will have Dr. Sol Pedre, 
She is head of the CARM SMR project led by the Argentinian National Atomic Energy Commission. The CARM reactor currently under construction is the first power reactor completely designed and built in, by Argentina, one further step in over 70 years of nuclear development in Argentina. Dr. Pedre is also a professor at the Balseiro Institute. So let me start uh, with Tom. So Tom, as, a, as chairman of the uh, SMR task force that published the report you are intimately familiar with. It's, so um, you are familiar with its finding and recommendations. And furthermore, at uh, new scale, as new scale has now completed design certification for the new scale power module, from a reactor vendor's per perspective, what are the challenges with the current national approaches to licensing in our view? The uh, first challenge is uh, simply getting approved by a regulator. Um, we applied to the United States uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which has a reputation, you know, being thorough and tough. And we knew that going in. Uh, we were surprised, in, including myself, who worked at the NRC a long time, at the depth and breadth of the review. But you know, we got through it, and we got the standard design approval. Um, the challenge of the current approach is that first approval, even by the NRC isn't enough for subsequent regulators. Um, now that isn't to say that regulators don't collaborate, they do. And the NRC has bilaterals with many countries. They work together uh, on new scale and other designs. And so that helps. Um, further, once you've been approved by, by one, you do have a head start with subsequent regulators because at the end of the day, um, regulators have very similar safety concerns. They, they approach the problem differently, they ask it differently, but the same safety issues exist regardless of where you deploy. So you have information that for the bulk of the application uh, needs to be translated to very similar requirements. But there are differences and those differences require a lot of effort to address and can change the design. And that, to me, you know, is the big question. Uh, do these design changes result in necessary safety improvements, or is it just creating another design that is about the same safety as that approved by the original? I mean, to put it another way, does anyone believe a design approved by the NRC, or you can insert another uh, major regulator, is not safe enough when viewed holistically? And if you say, well, yeah, of course it's safe enough, um, then why does it need to be modified to become another holistically uh, safe design? Because it is those design changes <clears throat> that diminish um, the benefits of SMRs in particular, which are, which are designed for the most part to be built anywhere and shipped anywhere. Um, and if you have to customize them for each country, you're, you're taking away that, some of that benefit. Thank you. So I understand the, the challenges uh, um, created by this approach. And according to you, what are the risks that this approach creates? Uh, and are any of these risks unique to SMRs? Um, so I alluded to it there. So the current approach uh, creates risks to design stability, the supply chain, and costs. Design stability is affected by two factors, the codes and standards expected by the regulator and country specific requirements that force design changes. Um, both of these, either one of these, uh, you, you use a different code, uh, that's a different design. Um, and these different designs create a more complex supply chain. Uh, both of those things drive up the cost of nuclear with again, uh, little if any and potentially negative safety benefits. Um, and again, costs are further impacted because the plants become more custom. Uh, the risks aren't unique to SMRs. This is true for really any design, but they are more severe for SMRs, um, both because of the lower power output. So spreading that design diversity over a smaller amount of output has a bigger impact, but it also takes away some of the benefits that were expected. You know, at least some SMRs are designed to be nearly complete nuclear steam supply systems or even complete plants prior to shipment on site. And for those to be largely manufactured and assembled in a factory instead of in the field. So the more you make SMRs look like little big reactors instead of sort of the unique innovative 
in, in safer ways to produce electricity. The, the more you hurt the industry, uh, and ultimately, if we're looking for decarbonization, you know, people of Earth. Okay, thank you very much for your views, Tom. Now I would like to address uh, Nadezhda Sannikova. So Nadezhda, uh, Rosatom has a successfully licensed, built, and is currently operating a couple of SMRs on the academic uh, Lomonosov. And you are currently developing updated land-based versions of these reactors. Can you elaborate whether there is additional complexity for floating SMRs versus land-based ones? Thank you for this question. I really like the way it is formulated uh, because when we say additional complexity, uh, we mean that we assume that there is a specific list of uh, requirements and procedures that are basic complexity. And this uh, list is uh, the same for land-based and floating SMRs. Uh, however, today there is no specific requirements for SMRs, both land-based and floating on the international level. So the situation for this project is uh, nearly the same and uh, the licensing uh, process will be developed and adopted when licensing or pre-licensing those projects. On the national level in Russia, the situation is uh, slightly different because we have uh, a package of uh, regulations uh, created, adapted for floating SMRs like Academic Lomonosov. And this package is based, this framework is based on the experience of uh, design, licensing and operation of icebreakers free. <coughs> Uh, what differs from the land-based SMRs is the fact that uh, the floating SMR as a ship is subject both to nuclear regulation and maritime nuclear regulation. And this uh, ship-related background of floating SMRs provides a, a possibility for new and innovative approaches in licensing. Uh, for example, when designing nuclear power plant in Russia, a land-based one, we are, accept, we are, accepted, um, we are accept, expected that uh, this design will meet the requirements of the other country when it is deployed. And we should adapt the project to the site-specific uh, site and to the uh, legal-specific, regulatory-specific of the country uh, where the project will be deployed. And for floating SMRs, uh, when uh, we construct a floating SMR in Russia, uh, it is done uh, according to the requirements uh, to design and construction in Russia. And when uh, the ship is expected to leave the port of Russia, it should have uh, the license of the Russian regulatory body and also a specific certificate of the maritime regulatory body of Russia. Uh, so uh, both these documents prove uh, that uh, the, uh, the floating nuclear power unit is ready for operation and it meets all the safety requirements. So what happens when this uh, floating power unit comes to the host country? Uh, we can, uh, having this specific ship background of the floating power unit, we can look at the specific procedures uh, that I described in SOLAS convention for nuclear ships. Uh, and the, uh, they differ from the land-based ones. So uh, Solos says that uh, the respective governmental bodies of the host country can review the documents issued by the national regulator of the floating nuclear power unit and reviewing them, decide whether it is possible to uh, operate this floating unit on the territory of the host state or not. So it allows um, uh, this uh, approach doesn't presuppose the adaptation of the project to the different regulation of the host country. Uh, that is completely impossible because the uh, <coughs> power unit is already constructed. And also the designer and the operator can uh, use their solutions that are proven by R&D and operational experience. I strongly hope that this approach uh, allows to use all the advantages of the SMRs design. And uh, of course, uh, we have no experience uh, of such approach now. And uh, the details should be elaborated with the customer country, taking into account its specific requirements and regulations and the issues of the customer. But uh, maybe using this approach, uh, we can uh, benefit 
from the possibility of SMRs to be of serial production. So the same unit, the same floating unit for all the sites. So the idea is uh, thank completely you. different from the land based. Okay, thank you, Nadezhda. Uh, maybe another question and maybe a, a, a short answer because we are just in time. So uh, Rosatom has projects of all sizes outside Russia. Thus you have had uh, some experience interacting with several international regulators. Do you see the same challenges as those raised by Tom with projects that Rosatom is developing outside of Russia for large scale reactors today and for SMRs in the future? So sure, I like very much the idea that uh, Tom pronounced that there is a dilemma between uh, the innovations in SMRs and uh, the uh, necessity for the regulator to prove safety of these innovations. But it is an evolutionary process and I think we should uh, interact with the regulator, with, uh, with the designer in order to find some balanced, uh, balanced solution to this issue. Thank you, Nadezhda. Uh, now I would like to turn to, uh, towards Rafael. So Rafael, um, I am and we all are really interested in your perspective on this. Can you elaborate on what Sintos Green Energy Project Development Plans from the point of view of a project developer, one that is looking to provide zero carbon energy to industry in Poland, how important is uh, having relatively straightforward and predictable access to an international market of nuclear technologies and SMRs in particular? Good morning, everybody. So yes, indeed, uh, Sintel's Green Energy is a company with focus on uh, deep decarbonization of the largest private industrial group in Poland and uh, Polish industry. We start our SMR project two years ago. Um, actually, we are we open dialogue with the Polish regulator PAA on um, licensing issue for light water reactors. Uh, we're just in the beginning of the road. As I said, this is a pre-licensing dialogue with the Polish regulator. Uh, we also cooperate with. Uh, a number of, of US uh, utilities um, with a development of uh, light water reactors in, um, in US and also in, in Poland and on the Canadian market as well. Um, this is what we, we do uh, as, a, as a country without experience with the nuclear and uh, as a company who has uh, no nuclear experience. We start with the building regulatory frames and prepare our own proposal for the, to the government with the required uh, regulatory changes. By the way, we are in the middle of this process because Polish government just proposed last week uh, um, changes for the nuclear law and nuclear investment law. And we're going to add a part about SMRs and about uh, MMRs. In, we expect that Poland can be a great market for SMRs in future. We going to the commission 200 coal fire boilers between 100 and 300 megawatts so electric. So we are perfect for SMRs deployment in future. It's why also we decided to invest into this technology. Uh, and actually we are also on the very advanced process of the pre-screening of some sites in Poland and I hope that very soon we'll be ready to, um, to start pre-licensing for the sites, uh, plural number, because we hope to deploy more than, uh, much more than one reactor. We're thinking about the fleet of SMRs um, during the next two decades in, in Poland. Um, so that's my perspective. I would like to say also that uh, thank you very much for nuclear um, session not only for invitation to this meeting, but also for the uh, report you publish uh, about regulatory expectations for SMRs. Uh, it's excellent and very helpful. And I need to say that we're going exactly with uh, guidance from this report. Uh, so uh, it perfectly match our, our expectations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rafa. This is nice to hear. Uh, this is nice to have a 
positive feedback from uh, on our publications. So you said you had contact with uh, national regulators, but I understand you need not uh, really start pre-licensing activities to prepare for future project development. Uh, do you think that a, a more uh, internationally, uh, internationally streamlined uh, regulatory approach would minimize the need for this upcoming uh, pre-licensing process you will face? Absolutely. Um, there are two battles in Europe in the front of us. First is taxonomy and recognition of nuclear in European taxonomy. A second battle, it will be building regulatory frames for SMRs. Um, this is what I can say that uh, these days in Europe, we have uh, more regulatory standards than a kind of cheese in France. Uh, that's first. A second, uh, I would like to say that we expect from uh, the most mature and developed uh, nuclear market in the world from the US to take uh, leadership. And I think that uh, the role of NSC and cooperation between NSC and different vendors in US interested in the deployment of US SMRs in Europe and in Poland, for example, and relation between NSC and uh, local regulators also building multilateral agreements um, uh, for country of origin recognition, it could be very helpful. So um, international acceptance, international pressure of the governments and regulatory standards uh, would be required, definitely. Thank you, Rafa, that's very interesting. And, uh, and thank you for making the link for me. You mentioned the US NRC, so I will now turn uh, uh, towards uh, Anna, Anna Bradford. So Anna, uh, moving to the regulatory viewpoint, we are quite keen to understand the regulatory perspective on SMRs. How does the NRC view the need for widespread development of SMRs and what challenges do you foresee in the future, Anna? Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to this conference. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm answering it from a little bit of a different perspective than the others on the panel as an independent regulator. We don't decide you know, which technologies should be deployed, whether it's a small reactor or a large reactor. We just want them to be safe regardless. However, I am currently the chair of the SMR Regulators Forum at the IAEA, and I can see from that activity that SMRs can certainly meet the needs of many countries across the world, whether they're embarking countries or mature regulators. I think some of the challenges for SMRs are similar to those for large reactors when it comes to things like public acceptance. Um, I think people hear reactor and react whether it's a small one or a large one. And I think there are concerns about new technologies that have not been tested. And I think some other challenges would be um, similar to, again, to large light water reactors, the embarking countries that don't have an established regulatory framework for a power reactor, that's something that's going to need to be developed for SMRs. For those countries that do have large reactors already, they may need to undergo kind of a mindset change when it it comes to uh, licensing small modular reactors. You heard Tom mention that getting through the US NRC was not easy and, it, and it's not, and it's purposely not easy because we wanna make sure that these new designs still meet our safety requirements. And I think when you're first of a kind, when you're the first SMR going through a licensing process, it can be challenging because it's new to the regulator as well as to other stakeholders. But I think once you get past that first of a kind, and get to the end of a kind, it becomes more streamlined and more efficient. So those are some of the challenges I see for SMR worldwide deployment. Okay, thank you for this, uh, for this view, Anna. So you mentioned some uh, current challenges. Do you um, anticipate new challenges in the future? Have you seen uh, any trends so far among all the uh, numerous uh, projects that have been submitted uh, either to the NRC or more globally to the regulatory community. And as you say, as a, a chairperson of the uh, SMR regulatory framework, you may exchange on these, uh, on these issues uh, among this forum. So 
Can you tell us more about these potential additional challenges and trends? Thank you. Sure. Uh, for licensing, I think one challenge can be that some of the companies developing these reactors, they're quite different than the big players that have been in nuclear power industry for many years. Some of them are small companies, they have great design ideas, but they're not used to, I will say, maybe the rigor of nuclear licensing. And again, I'm speaking from the viewpoint of a regulator here. So that can be a challenge. They might not be equipped maybe to answer all the questions that the regulator has, or perhaps the design is not completely fully developed yet. It might still be in a conceptual stage or maybe 50% developed, but the regulator might need more information than that to make sure that we can make our safety finding. I think another challenge is, is the wide variety of technologies that are being developed. I mean, it, it's similar for large reactors. So for example, the US works with Canada a lot. Canada is used to can-do reactors for the most part. In the US, we're, we're used to PWRs and BWRs. So our regulatory frameworks are similar in some ways, but there is that technology difference that can present a challenge when we're trying to share ideas about how to regulate reactors. And when it comes to small modular reactors, there's an even wider variety of different technologies out there. And so it can be hard to focus your attention on one and to share information with another country because they might not be looking at the same design at all. I think another challenge is that computer models may not apply. Models that have been developed for large light water reactors might not be applicable or may need to be significantly revised in order to give you meaningful information for small modular reactors, especially those that are not light water cooled. And then operating experience might not apply. You know, we at the in the US we have 50, 60 years of operating experience that we rely on to make decisions. And we might not have that for small modular reactors, again, especially for those that are non light water cooled. So I think those are some of the, the licensing challenges that we've encountered. Thank you for this view, Anna. And um, hopefully I, I believe that um, some of the challenges you pointed out are also, um, uh, let's say, described and discussed in the uh, recent WNA uh, publication um, about design maturity. And hopefully we try to give guidance, advice, recommendations in order to engage with the regulatory community with the uh, necessary level of information, detail, so that a, a constructive uh, dialogue can start. So this is, this was one of the goals when we uh, initiated uh, this publication. So now I would like to, to turn to our other panelist, uh, Dr. Pedre. So, um, Saul, uh, the National Atomic Energy Commission in Argentina has been supporting the design, licensing, and construction of the current 25 reactor design. Could you elaborate further on the Commission's approach to this? What has the overall strategy been? So, please. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Also, it's very interesting to hear you all. Um, to give you a little background, uh, the current project is part of um, a, a kind of relaunch of the Argentinian nuclear program that, that was around 2006 and included a package that also included the um, the, the culmination of the our Tucha 2 power reactor and the life extension of our Kandu reactor in Embalse. And so basically there's like an added problem that maybe you don't face that we have to basically reconstruct most of our technical teams. That's why we have a lot of maybe older engineers with young engineers and beautiful like me, as I may add. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> Uh, and basically, the current project was entrusted to the National Atomic Energy Commission because um, because this is the government institution that it is, it is in charge of the main scientific and technological innovations in the nuclear sector in Argentina. And since it was an innovative new reactor, it was like the, the perfect place to, to start this design. The National Atomic Energy Commission has basically mothered all the other nuclear sector companies and, has, and in Argentina has shares in all of them. There's a, like a, a big nuclear ecosystem for such a small country. And, and basically, well, to accommodate these projects, we had to make um, 
we had to make some um, administrative uh, um, changes so it was easy to develop such a big project in, an, in a government institution and of course to rebuild this the, the technical teams. So in this situation, I wanted to tell you this so you understand why was the strategy uh, that Argentina uh, started. In this situation, uh, the strategy was to design and build a scale prototype uh, to test the main innovative concepts and to develop the necessary technical teams and the administrative cap capabilities in, in the National Atomic Energy Commission and other nuclear companies that were very, well, a little bit destroyed over <laughs> after this, this large period and to take this next step in our nuclear national program. At the same time, we are not new to the nuclear, uh, to the nuclear arena. Uh, we have 70 years of, of nuclear tradition in Argentina. And the main idea uh, for, for our country in all these years has been to, um, to anchor the, the, the different projects in the, in the, um, to maximize the Argentinian engineering and, and fabrication uh, uh, participation in this project that has been always in all the Argentinian nuclear projects, the main line to develop and, and sustain the supply chain. And, and, and that's, uh, that's also very, very important in the, in the current projects. And so, so that you have an idea, we have three nuclear power plants uh, operating in all these nuclear power plants, even though they were they were bought and 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 built here, there was always an interest in 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 maximizing the participation of Argentinian industry, and we also have the control of the complete natural uranium um, fuel cycle and the uh, export of of radio, radio isotope producing reactors. So we are not new, but but we are we are not. A big country like Russia, Russia or, or the US, you know. Or France, no? Huh? <laughs> or France, I'm sorry, or France, of course. <laughs> or... No kidding. Um, so, so I understand that this is a very uh, important project for Argentina. Uh, could you tell us whether there have been any interactions and uh, or collaborative efforts with other governments that may be interested in the current design? And to which extent uh, those interactions uh, inform any uh, decisions which can be made uh, by Argentina uh, towards uh, international streamlining? And if I further continue, what, what is the relationship uh, and the cooperation level at, uh, uh, between the CNEA, uh, the, the government, and the Argentinian uh, regulator? which of course uh, is independent. Eh? So can you, can you tell us about this, please? Okay, so uh, today our main goal is, is the effort to conclude the prototype. And in, in a not so distant future, probably this year or, or during the next year, we need to start a series of discussion among the main Argentinian nuclear companies to see how we scale the prototype to an industrial or commercial version. Both for our own energetic needs, we are a very a large country, so these type of reactors can can really be used uh, to 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 use less cables, let's say, and also to create another high added value export. As as I was sort of telling you already, we have some experience and in exporting nuclear technologies, especially in in these uh, research reactors, and we would mm -hmm. like to to repeat this. Of course, I think in these efforts, the international collaboration will be very important. And I think that there's a lot to be explored in this area. We are very, very um, in the initial stages of this uh, international exploration. And I think for Argentina, uh, these, these uh, relations are not only with big countries like the US or France, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but also, but also with, with smaller countries that are starting in their nuclear programs. We have had very, very good experience in, in in the previous years in this in this terms because we are we are being a, a small country ourselves we are also open to 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 teach and to learn and to accommodate uh, smaller countries needs of course I, I have to make a point here this may be quite obvious but when you're talking about international collaboration you have to always take into account the argentinian di diplomatic and international needs and interest as a whole especially when we're talking about nuclear power, it's not only a technical discussion, not even a commercial discussion, it, it takes on a lot of another, another dimension. 
So this is also a, this we have to take this into account when we talk to other international parties. Regarding the, co the cooperation between the National Atomic Energy and the, re the regulatory agent, we have a lot of cooperation right now because this is the first time Argentina is designing and building a power reactor from scratch. There is some uh, previous um, experience with the Atuta 2 reactor because uh, since uh, that was a Siemens-based reactor and when we started finishing, Siemens had left uh, the nuclear uh, industry, so actually we had to this to finish the design ourselves. So there is some experience in in in, in sort of taking uh, um, uh, a reactor and finishing it ourselves. But what is definitely different in the CARAM is that it's a prototype reactor and a small model reactor. So uh, so we had to basically develop between the two institutions a sense of an ad hoc procedure for this case that has involved from the regulatory agency from the very, very initial design phases. And I, I, I may add two distinct characteristics. One is that the, the regulatory agency has given us a permission to start building the reactor without completing the, the without giving us the permission to operate it if you want to, if you want it. So we, we started building the reactor uh, with not the complete licensing done uh, that's different, but it was needed because in this, in our type of country and in and for a prototype reactor, we had to start testing something and start developing our supply chain uh, before all the papers are completely done. Of course, they will not give us permission to to operate if we don't have everything uh, in order. Um, and the other very interesting thing that I think one of the other panelists were mentioned is that. Basically, uh, we we developed a special classification system for structure systems and components that was developed by the National Atomic Energy Commission and approved by, by the, the regulatory agency that's more tailored for a small modular reactor design. I'm sorry, maybe I, I went too, too, too long with the answer, but it was a very interesting point. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's interesting and uh, maybe later some topics you mentioned about safety classification could be further discussed, I believe, with the IAEA because they are currently uh, reviewing the applicability of their safety standards uh, to SMR. So this may be a, a, a good point to discuss with them. Uh, so thank you, Saul. And now I, I would like to uh, come back to, uh, well, continue with the panelists. And I would have a question for Rafael. So, uh, Rafael, following this same line related to the need for greater uh, international collaboration to support project development, what are your thoughts about the recommendations in the report regarding greater international regulatory cooperation? And ultimately, what can the national governments, regulators, and the nuclear industry do to make your job and the job of other organizations seeking to deploy new reactors easier? Would you please elaborate? Tricky question. Uh, yes, that's a long list. Uh, I can say what uh, we can do, and international organizations regulate and should do to speed up the process of deployment. Um, first, I, I would say that uh, what we do, uh, in, we we hire or we cooperate with uh, excellent services, uh, excellent services um, uh, with the building regulatory roadmap for Poland uh, for SMR's deployment. That, that's first. We work with the excellent generation on feasibility study uh, of some SMRs and um, also regulatory uh, required changes um, and um, application for the general opinion about the technology and organization, which is the first step in the pre-licensing process uh, in Poland. We work with the Fortum and with the Tractable. Uh, Tractable is, uh, uh, is already in process in preparing acquired um, changes in the regulations in Poland for us, and also with the um, legal advisors. So this, this is what we do and what international community of nuclear can do. Obviously, there is a lot of things like multilateral uh, agreements between regulators or between countries to recognize country of origin or recognize licensing. 
I believe strongly that if something is uh, licensed in the United States, will be licensed soon. Uh, it will be very helpful uh, if some guidance will be provided for the local regulators or local governments. Um, so there is uh, a lot of standards like Cordell, uh, which we already work with uh, as the best, um, let's say, um, guidance for, um, for technology developers like we are. But um, I do believe in international standardization. Um, two years ago, there was a first meeting, US, uh, US uh, uh, European Commission, um, high level SMRs uh, meeting and I participated, we participated as a company in this meeting. So it was a good first step. I hope we'll have more, especially that's, um, I believe uh, we have no choice than uh, burning natural gas or building SMRs. And uh, in places like Poland, especially very well developed district heating, uh, we have five, 55 megawatts thermal of district heating. You can simply not replace current coal fire plants uh, with something else except burning natural gas or building SMRs for district heating. You cannot uh, um, supply and heat cities like Warsaw, Wrocław, uh, Krakow, and other. So it could be, it creates great opportunity for US vendors uh, and we believe US uh, regula regulations as a product uh, in, in the situation of Poland and also the countries. Thank you for these views, uh, uh, Rafael. And once again, you, you provide me as the opportunity for a good link because you mentioned the US and RC. So uh, I will turn towards Anna. Uh, if I can bring uh, you in on this, I, I think that uh, regulators are recognizing the need for greater international collaboration and the report identifies activities such as the IAEA Regulators uh, Forum, which you chair, and a recent uh, MOC signed between the NRC and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, CNSC. So I was wondering if there, are, there is uh, any feedback from these activities and what challenges are currently being addressed? Please, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that question. I, I would say that on the regulator side, at least, we've cooperated going back for decades. You know, I'm sure some of us remember MDEP, which, is start, which was started up several years ago and is still going on at the NEA. So we always are looking to share information with other regulators to see what they've learned, how they're approaching things, how we can all do things better. Um, I think that we are working even harder to share information for SMRs because we want to learn from each other's experience. The SMR Regulators Forum has been ongoing since about 2015. And we've issued several reports on the, pub on the IEA public website talking about common positions of the regulators with respect to SMRs. I think some of the challenges are similar. In my opinion, one of the biggest challenges is um, the sovereign ability of each country to determine the safety that is required for their reactors. I mean, so at the USNRC, we have a lot of control over regulations and what it is we think is required to provide public health and safety. But we do have a box that we have to operate in that's set by the laws that are passed by our Congress. So for example, the Atomic Energy Act for us <clears throat> requires, for example, that there be something we call ITAC after a reactor is constructed, where <clears throat> the regulator goes in and makes sure that it was constructed the way it's supposed to be. I don't know of any other country that requires ITAC. So right there is a challenge that just going back to the fundamental laws and sovereignty of each country, it can be a challenge. So that's the, one of the biggest hurdles I see. Okay, thank you for this view, uh, Anna. Uh, so maybe I will now turn to towards Tom. So Tom, uh, having previously worked for the NRC and having successfully guided new scales through the design certification process, you have had the opportunity to examine this issue through both lenses. Uh, so are these proactive approaches that a vendor or regulator can take that would go a long way towards accelerating uh, international licensing? 
what opportunities and challenges do you foresee in the desire to harmonize and streamline international regulatory approaches, Tom? Yeah, it's uh, been a very interesting experience being on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. When I was at the NRC and in the Office of New Reactors, you know, I participated in, in the MDEP, uh, Multinational Design Evaluation Program, and, you know, had the view that, you know, industry needed to get its house in order, specifically, you know, harmonize the codes and standards. Of course, now that I'm on the industry side, I see the real problem is the regulators need to harmonize their requirements. Um, so it's a little joke. There, there's work that can be done both. But, you know, I think when we talk about if we if harmonization means like a common set of requirements uh, that everyone agrees to sort of the aviation model, um, I'm skeptical that that can occur in a in a time frame that's needed. Um, perhaps, you know, decarbonization will become a sufficient driver where countries decide, you know, we got to get this done so we can uh, more fully deploy nuclear power. Um, so there may be, that's why I say this, you know, if, if you believe the NRC makes a good holistic uh, safety finding, so I'm talking about design when I say safety. So things like ITAC that, that Anna mentioned, those are process things that shouldn't affect the design um, and can be dealt with, but the actual is the design as you propose to construct it acceptable, um, even if it's using a code from a different country, um, you know, again, does the RCC provide a lesser design than the ASME? Uh, you know, I doubt it when you, again, you look at it holistically um, that you're saying, yes, we're not, we're not going to not look at it all. We're not just going to say, well, the NRC approved it, you know, rubber stamp. Um, but that you, collaboration between the NRC, which does occur uh, with other regulators is, well, this doesn't meet our requirements exactly. How did you find this design acceptable? That sort of coming to a common understanding of how the, both the vendor and the regulator concluded the design was safe enough. Um, would go a long way. It's a form of harmonization, not what we've typically used, but it's probably something that be that can be done in in the near term. Um, and you ask, you know, what can vendors do? Uh, vendors can do a lot. So, you know, as an example, simple example. So, you know, we're a U.S. based company. We applied to the NRC. Uh, the NRC, the U.S. is a nuclear weapons state. So, IAEA safeguards aren't done the same in a nuclear weapon state, but we know we intend to deploy to non-weapon states. So um, even though the features associated with IAEA safeguards aren't included in the certified design, uh, the ability to add those features is already built into the design. So we anticipated the need to do that elsewhere. And that's like a common thing that any vendor it's going to have to do. You're going to have to be prepared for IAEA safeguards um, unless you're you're only going to market to nuclear weapons states. Okay, thank you for this use, Tom. Uh, now I would like to to turn again towards uh, Nadezhda. So, Nadezhda, what is your perspective? Are there uh, some good examples of successful approaches taken by Rosatom to optimize the process of licensing a given, reactor, a given reactor design in a new country. Could you tell us about Rosatom experience, please, Nadezhda? Sure. Uh, when Thank we you. are preparing for licensing process, uh, we look at uh, three major groups of standards and requirements. And the first one are the IA standards uh, that are non-binding, but uh, they contain some fundamental safety principles, so we are expected to meet them. And uh, as for SMRs, for example, to optimize the future licensing process, we now participate in the IA activity on aimed at uh, analyzing the applicability of the existing standards to the SMRs design. And we hope this activity uh, will help us to uh, understand uh, where we are now and what uh, can be done in order to facilitate, to promote the future SMR deployment. The other two groups are national standards and uh, supranational standards like European standards. And the problem is that uh, those standards are really uh, different. And uh, the, it, the process of optimization of standardization 
of licensing is uh, completely uh, difficult and nearly uh, and close to being impossible. But there are some specific features, some uh, elements uh, that uh, help us to facilitate this process. Uh, those uh, like uh, having experienced and competent staff, first of all, then uh, the process uh, inter of interaction between the regulator and uh, the designer and the customer that should be organized in a prompt way and uh, it should be a well-organized um, information exchange. Uh, this issue was also marked in the report uh, made by uh, Cardell. And uh, what's uh, really important is a preparatory work. Uh, based on the experience of uh, supporting licenses, uh, licensing in Hungary, Iran, uh, Egypt, uh, Bangladesh, and other countries, we know that it is really important uh, to analyze uh, the difference between the requirements in Russia and uh, national standards of the country of deployment, the uh, infrastructure within the country of deployment, and other specific features. And the better this uh, preparatory work is done, uh, the easier licensing process is. Thank you, Nadezhda. Thank you for this use. So maybe I, I will ask a question to, uh, to Dr. Sol uh, Pedre. Uh, so uh, Sol, we have discussed the current 25 project previously, and um, we are wondering uh, uh, in line with this discussion on opportunities and challenges, if looking back from where you are today, uh, if there are anything that would ultimately have made the development of CARM25 and or the export of technology easier. What do you think is the optimum level of interaction between governments and their regulators? And how can a government uh, incentive Advice or uh, uh, facilitate and empower regulatory authorities to innovate and to streamline their processes without compromising their independence? Okay, so um, that's a very big question. Um, yeah. I, I think one of uh, uh, the main, the main uh, uh, struggles in Argentina has been this, this, uh, this different uh, political and economic periods that has like all, all the time challenged the development of, of these new technologies. Incredibly, the nuclear sector has survived 70 years of history in Argentina, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I think may, maybe this doesn't apply to, to your countries. I think in some, in some points it does because there's a, there's a big issue that has, uh, has been already posed in this, in this panel that is the local, local social licensing of, of the activity. And that's, I think the barriers, the political, uh, and uh, how, how, much, how much really support you get for this type of, 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 uh, of development. So I think that's one point that was in some, in some parts outside of our hands. Uh, I think another key aspect is to, is to really um, work the, the, the relations with the other nuclear companies in the sector. The, it's very important not only to think from the point of view of, of the design, but also who is going to build the design, who is going to build the fuel, who is going to build all the, all the parts and how, how you make this work in, 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 a, in a country like, like Argentina. And in, in that sense, I think there has been uh, not not all the time there has been a very holistic relationship i think now we're working on that and it's very important to think to take that and a, a good point i think a, a very important point at least in the current project we are playing like new 3d tools to to uh, to design all in the in the same place and and uh, a systems view and all these like new methodologies i think it's very important to work on them especially if you, if you want a project of this size to, to work and, and, with, and to, take, to comply with all the safety ne necessary, but also to make it cost effective. And I think uh, uh, regarding the, the question about the regulatory agency, um, I think the kind of, of interaction we are having, uh, it's, 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 very, it's very good. Uh, for this kind of designs, I, I, what, what I was telling earlier, to really work on, on what type of classification you need for this type of new designs is very, very important. I think you, you cannot just 
go your own way and and then take the papers it it will it will not work okay thank you so thank you for these views so uh, so we are uh, reaching the almost the end of this seminar so uh, so I understand that one key word uh, we have heard a lot is uh, interaction. And so the premise of this webinar is that cross-pollination among uh, different uh, stakeholders helps develop ideas that can be used to alter the current licensing and regulatory paradigm and streamline international regulatory framework. So I will ask uh, uh, each uh, panelist maybe to quickly react and to, to give me their thought about the next logical step in terms of the recommendations uh, which are provided in the report around greater cooperation and streamlining of regulatory requirements. What could this be and uh, how would you look to implement these? So uh, maybe I could start with, uh, I'd say, Anna, would you like to give us your view? Sure, thank you. I think that the report recommendations were good. I think they are things that, that can be tackled. I think some of it, as we've heard today, are quite challenging. And I think Tom mentioned that we might not be able to get to a streamlined or a harmonized approval process in the timeframes that people are hoping that we can. So it doesn't mean it can't be done. I'm just not sure it can be done quickly enough to satisfy those who would like it done, you know, last year, we would already like it to be done. So I think we as regulators, uh, uh, speaking from the regulators viewpoint, need to continue talking to each other, sharing information, trying to work towards that goal, understanding that it does benefit both the regulator and the designer, I believe, and sharing information and trying to be consistent and learn from each other. So in my mind, if we continue down the path we're going, I think at some point we will get there. It's just gonna take a little time. And resources, I imagine. And resources, definitely. <laughs> so a message to the government. Huh? Um, and so the experience of a uh, level of values regulatory authorities around the world is, is quite different. Huh? So uh, how do you think can regulator vendors and other support uh, and others support each other to help accelerate the knowledge transfer towards new regulators? So again, maybe Anna, but maybe uh, also some uh, vendors or any panelists could, uh, could react to this uh, question. Anyone would like to, to take the question? Okay, I'll, Anna. Let Anna. Well, I'll defer to the regulator. Okay. Again, when you say like there's, a, there's an urgent need and there's a longer term need and, and there's a couple questions I see about you know what our experience is with the NRC and the CNSC, who's also reviewing us, the Canadian regulator. And, and that's probably, I think, as, as good as about you can expect right now. Um, they have a memorandum of cooperation. Um, they've collaborated a long time. When I was at the NRC, you know, we collaborated with CNSC on AP1000, who was going, going under the VDR as well at, at that time. Um, so there's a built-in relationship there, um, and in the CNSC is taking that, trying to understand uh, what, why the NRC approved things that are different than the Canadians. Um, a specific example is even our fuel is typical PWR, Framatome, Frank fuel, um, 17 by 17. It's half height, but basically the same stuff, but it's not uh, can-do fuel, and so uh, that's one of the focus areas in that collaboration is the differences in fuel types. Um, in the Canadian regulator, they're more aligned with IAEA on things like uh, system classification, defense in depth, um, but we're translating mainly what we provided to the NRC for Canada is sort of de novo. We're not seeing new design changes uh, to accommodate, at least not yet, um, to accommodate uh, any specific regulatory requirements. It's, it's explaining why it's the same. And when you talk about countries that are sort of new to nuclear, again, and Anna can elaborate, but the NRC has a pretty big outreach program for those regulators 
and in our interactions with those countries, they again they they want to understand why the NRC found it safe, right? So um, there's a role for both. We we have to carry the bulk of the water as the vendor. We still need to convince that regulator the design is safe, but uh, the NRC uh, plays a helpful role there. So this sort of country by country approach, design by design approach, um, it may not be the most efficient, but um, you know it's a step towards getting to that most, more efficient thing while everybody's learning about these new designs. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, so maybe I, I will continue with um, another question. So. So some people think that international licensing of technologies with high readiness levels, such as what cool based technologies, will be easier due to the large experience based on accumulated uh, in the industry and regulators. Others think that newer technologies, such as uh, SMRs, for example, may be easier to streamline if an effort is made to develop global standards and licensing process from the very beginning since very little is already in place. So maybe I, I, I will address uh, the question to, uh, to Rafael because he, he told us he's a, uh, well, his company is a, is a newcomer in the uh, nuclear area and maybe having a, a view from a nuclear, newcomer to give advice to us, uh, well, let's say, uh, older and maybe with a restricted view. So Rafael, would you, uh, would you give us your views about what could, uh, what advice could be given to uh, national governments, regulators and nuclear industry in terms of how to get SMR faster to, to market and reduce risk and uncertainty in a project development? All my life, I try to stay optimist. So uh, uh, I will not say that global standard is impossible or that we will never get it. I think we, we, we can. We, we should try to have a global standard for licensing to push such agreements, to propose such agreement. Who should be a leader of such philosophy of the global SMR deployment? I will not say because I don't want to mention third time NSC. Uh, but um, but um, that's somehow obvious for me. It's just the the, the most the, the best recognized uh, regulator in all over the world. Yes, um, but uh, I would like to say that um, success will come also with the market success. And I strongly believe that new scale open a door uh, through the regulatory process for SMRs in United States. And very soon we'll have a similar situation in Canada. And the UK market probably with uh, Tom Samson SMR UK project. So with the commercial success, the, um, the changes will come. And this is something we strongly believe that there will be more and more country ready to develop and use cordial guidance to start multilateral agreements. And probably it will be it will lead to in future to more global standard for licensing and uh, regulation of SMRs and faster deployment. Uh, can it happen in the early 30s? Uh, yes, with success of SMRs deployment in US and Canada, uh, it can speed up things. And I believe that next decade will be very interesting in the global energy market with the chance for the countries to retrofit qualifier plants with SMRs and with the global standard for deployment. It will definitely help to achieve the climate goals, it will help to um, develop economy and build world supply chain because this is very important, but the supply chain can be crucial and not everything can be shipped or produced in the factory, then ship it somewhere. And the global supply chain is is another reason why it's worth to create the global standard. So I try to be optimistic. I hope uh, it was a little bit. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you for this view. And I understand that this would be a kind of a virtuous circle, hopefully. Um, so maybe I, I will have a, a question for Nadiejda. 
what do you think is the most important thing that could be done to help accelerate uh, this process towards harmonization on your perspective? And what uh, do you think cooperation is needed with other stakeholders to drive this at the international level? So Nadjeshda, would you give us your views, please? Yes, thank you. In my opinion, the international licensing is a far future perspective. And now, especially for SMRs, we experience uh, the lack of uh, real uh, experience of licensing and operation. Um, moreover, the development of global licensing structure has some difficulties because it would be a rather long uh, and difficult process uh, to make uh, some standards, some requirements that would be commonly accepted. And then there is uh, one more problem connected uh, with the thing that uh, the changes in those global st standards uh, would also be difficult and alone and they couldn't be done simultaneously with the technology development that is principally important for the designers. Uh, so I think now we should focus on gaining a national experience of licensing and operation and uh, accumulating questions, cases, and so on, and uh, using international platforms to exchange, to exchange the views, to exchange the experience, and talk uh, about uh, specific problems. Uh, and uh, the focus should be on the exchange between regulators, the designers, and the customers, because uh, the opinions of all the stakeholders are important when elaborating new technology that is aimed to be international uh, expert like technology for international market. And thank you, Nadjezda. Thank you. So uh, I believe we are almost, uh, we just have a, a few minutes left. So I will turn towards uh, Alan. Do you think we have time for um, one or two questions from the audience before I ask uh, the last uh, comments from the panelists, Alan? Maybe one or two, Frank, uh, possibly something to address to all. Okay, so, okay, let me, um, let me then ask again all the panelists and I, I will ask them by order, the very last question. So I will ask for short answer, maybe one minute maximum each, because uh, we are really touching uh, uh, to, to the end of this uh, webinar. So uh, what do you think, or what would you like the international licensing framework to look like in five years time from now, for example? What would be the ideal uh, licensing framework? So I will ask maybe, uh, so maybe I, I will start with the vendors. So Tom, would you give us your view? You know, it would be, again, you're not going to see fully harmonized requirements in five years. That's uh, just not practical. Um, but a, a recognition that there needs to be, um, in some specific examples, uh, where regulators have taken this approach, they're not giving up their sovereignty but they are largely accepting the findings in terms of the design itself um, uh, with a basis for why they deviated from a country specific requirement. Um, so a hypothetical example is say they have a, a, a strictly deterministic, regardless of safety of the design, you have to have a second safety related boron injection system. Um, we don't, um, have that in our design and the NRC accepted that. So if, if a country could say, okay, we got it, you don't meet our specific, but we understand the overall safety case, you can proceed. That would be a significant accomplishment. Um, and of course it's very specific to us, but um, you know, that's a step towards this acceptance of a design that's overall safe, even if it doesn't meet every single requirement uh, at a regulator. I mean, even at the NRC, we, we didn't meet every single requirement. We had a large number of exemptions to requirements, right, that we had to justify. So in a way, if you look at our 
design as an international design, the NRC accommodated it through an exemption process by which they were able to convince themselves that even though the design didn't meet their regulations as written, it was still safe. So, you know, that's the type of thinking I think we need to see out of regulators. Okay, thank you, Tom. So maybe quickly I will ask the other panelists. So Saul, would you share with us uh, your view of the ideal uh, licensing framework? Very quickly, please. Okay, so, so I agree five years in nuclear is tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> And, and I, I think um, from, from our point of view, the, the, main, uh, the main goal in the next five years, we are not, not so thinking of internationalizing, but to put our prototype to work. And I think that will actually um, simplify <laughs> the, the, the international licensing for us, because that's basically the idea to have a prototype working so that we can show that it's safe, uh, apart from all the papers. And, and, and probably also help the others in a, in a small way because it, it's it would be <clears throat> an important step to have a, a small reactor working. So basically that, that's the, the point we are now. I, I don't have such an, a global view of what would be great. I think, um, I think that, uh, that our challenge now is, is that to make the prototype work, to get, uh, get the commercial version of the, of the, of the um, of the reactor uh, designed and, and to start these nego negotiations with other countries to see how, how we can export this technology. Okay, thank you. So, so very quickly, we just have two minutes left. So I would ask uh, uh, Nadezhda and then Rafael and then Anna to give us their view before I, uh, uh, before I uh, close uh, this webinar. So please, very quickly, uh, Nadezhda, then Rafael and then Anna. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, what can be really done in the future five years is uh, elaborating the concept of the global licensing. And uh, we can uh, just touch some principal questions like uh, what would be the relations between the global licensing body and national regulators? Uh, how can we uh, prove the independence of the global uh, licensing and so on? And as uh, we have uh, our uh, Russian SMRs projects that uh, are expected to be deployed in Russia in the nearly uh, years. Uh, we also focused on the harmonization of the our national uh, licensing, national regulation, and uh, maybe some best practices uh, can be also used uh, for uh, future global uh, regulatory uh, licensing processes. Thank you, Nadezhda. Rafael, a quick, uh, quick word? Quick. Uh, I'm surprised. I think that we all should stay definitely more positive and optimistic. And five years ago, nobody believed in um, the race of the SMRs developer and SMRs vendor will happen. And now we have almost a race globally uh, with different technologies uh, to license and, and deploy SMRs. Uh, we've um, five years ago, nobody thought that uh, a reduction of 55% of CO2 emission in the European Union can happen. Now it's a fact. So why we can't change a uh, regulatory process uh, globally on in Europe or uh, on main uh, world markets uh, during the next five years? Uh, I would stay much more optimistic. I think uh, that we can achieve much more than uh, we think, and we are a little bit poisoned by the old nuclear thinking, which is everything takes decades, or I can say century, um, over pessimistic. But you know, uh, let, let's stay optimistic because I think that uh, uh, the world and, and global changes can can surprise us positively. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you for your optimism. So, final word for Anna. Uh, can you uh, go on with optimism and give us your view? Well, if you're asking uh, me what I think the global regulatory framework should look like in five years, of course, I think it should look like the NRC's regulatory framework because <laughs> I think ours is very good and provides for uh, public health and safety while still allowing for flexibility and innovation. So in my mind, if we continue the, the bilateral and the multilateral 
work that we're doing with other countries, I think we can come to a place that is, is satisfactory for all the stakeholders. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, so uh, we're out of time. It's already uh, 16 or 17 past one. So that was very interesting. And thank you very much to uh, all the panelists for their um, uh, feedback, for their views. Thank you also uh, to WNA for preparing this webinar. Uh, we have been more than 220 people uh, online or even more. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Um, the WNA will do their best to answer all the uh, questions which were raised during the seminar. Unfortunately, I did not have, let's say, uh, time or the ability to check the question which were raised. So sorry if I did not uh, bring them online, but once again, uh, thank you to all. And uh, with this, I will give uh, the end back to, uh, to Alan to close this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And thank you all for attending the World Nuclear Association webinar, How Can We Streamline the Licensing of Small Modular Reactors? If you would like to find out more about the activities of the World Nuclear Association or any of its working groups, you can do so via our homepage at www.world-nuclear.org. With that, I will wish that you all have a great day.